a beautiful turn of events. Now, something I, I'm sure many of you are aware of, and maybe some of you aren't, but this is a very important principle. It's a very important, uh, it's something you need to hold on to. If you're young, you want to hold on to this for the rest of your life. If you're ever really going through a bad situation. And that's this. Before God changes our circumstances, He wants to change our hearts. If our circumstances change for the better, but we remain the same, then we'll become worse. God's purpose in providence isn't to make us comfortable, but to make us conformable, conformed to the image of his son. See, Christ-like character is the divine goal for each of God's children. Now, when we last saw Naomi in chapter 1, she had become bitter against God, but not Ruth. Ruth was willing for God to have his way in her life. So God began his gracious work with Ruth. Now, eventually, she will influence Naomi. And thereafter, after some time, God would bring to pass a wonderful work that would eventually bring the Son of God into the world. For now, at this very moment in our story, Ruth and Naomi, both of them, have absolutely no idea that they were going to be part of a bigger plan. Actually, not just a bigger plan, but an eternal plan that would fulfill God's promise to Abraham, a promise that was made in Genesis chapter 12, I believe, which is this, that his seed, Abraham's seed, would bring, would bring blessing to the entire world. Now, if you remember, again, also from last week, I, this story plays out like a, it can be interpreted or read like a dramatic play. And each, when you read a play or go through a play, each play has acts and scenes. Now, we, last week when we went through chapter one, that was scene one of act one. In this chapter two, here in chapter two, it's going to be act one, but it's going to be scenes two to four, again, in this dramatic story. If you read, again, the story as a drama, it's going to be like a summary flashback, preparing us, the readers and the listeners, for the second act. The lesson, you, hopefully, you'll learn here. It's going to show us that if we want God to work in our lives, if we want God to work in our circumstances and accomplish his gracious purposes, then there are certain conditions that we must meet. These conditions are illustrated in, in Ruth's experiences, and that's what we'll be examining in this chapter. So before we start reading, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we are here again, that you brought us all here. Um, I pray that you just bless this time, Lord, that you be, as we read your word, that it will come alive, that you will speak to us about things that we need to hear, that we need to know, Lord. And may your word just be implanted deep into our hearts and minds so that eventually they'll bear fruit. We know you're a great and awesome God. We know that you can do some great things now and over time. So now, Lord, as we get in chapter 2, speak to us through this story. 
once again. And just fill this room with your spirit. So now we honor you with our attention. Pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Ruth chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2. And I'll be beginning in verse 1. The Word of God says, Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side. He was a prominent man of noble character from Elimelech's, Elimelech's family. His name was Boaz. Ruth, the Moabitess, asked Naomi, Will you let me go into the fields and gather fallen grain behind someone with whom I find favor? Naomi answered her, Go ahead, my daughter. So Ruth left and entered the field to gather grain behind the harvesters. She happened to be in the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was from Elimelech's family. I'll stop there for now. These three verses, what they do is they tell us the first condition we must meet. Again, if you want God to work in our lives and circumstances to accomplish his purpose. And that first condition is this. We must live by faith in the Lord. There's a Latin proverb that says, Providence assists not the idol. Well, it appears here that this was certainly true for Ruth. She wasn't the kind of woman who could sit around and just do nothing. So she asked for Naomi's permission to glean the field so that they would have food to eat. Now this here, this act here, was just a huge step of faith on Ruth's part. You see, based, based on God's commandment in the law, Israelites weren't allowed to strip the fields uh, clean when harvesting. They weren't allowed to go into a field and completely take everything from that field, whether it's an olive orchard or, or whatever, it may, whatever that field is, they weren't allowed to take everything from it. Instead, they were instructed in Exodus chapter 23 and Leviticus 19 to leave some of the grain as gleanings for the needy, for strangers, for the fatherless, and for the widows. Now, the fact that, again, this law existed was proof of God's concern for the poor among his people. The Lord instructed the nation to treat the poor with justice, with fairness, and with generosity. Not only that, but God was also concerned for the widows, who were typically poor. If a woman was, at this time, the woman, the wife, depended 100% completely on her husband, on her children, on her sons to provide for her, to help her, Maintainer and the the children, the, the the sons and the husband knew this. They they had this responsibility. But if you remember from last week, Ruth's husband had died and her two sons had died, so she didn't have anyone. She didn't have anyone to provide for. So as a widow, she didn't really have much to fall back on. And this was again the case with many of the widows at that time. So again. Um, in Ruth's case, Ruth, she not only was a widow, but she was also an alien, meaning that she came from Moab. She was a Moabitess. She wasn't an Israeli. She wasn't a Jew. Therefore, again, she had every right to look to God for his help and provision. She completely depended on God. She trusted God that he would provide, knowing, again, that she didn't have a husband. It was just her. She trusted God. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 18, it says, 
He executes just, justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the resident alien, giving him food and clothing. Church, to live by faith means to take God at his word and then act upon it. James 2.20 says, faith without works is dead. He says, since Ruth believed that God loved her and would provide for her, she set out to find a field in which she would glean. Now this was completely an act of faith because being a stranger, she didn't know who owned the, the various parcels of ground that made the fields. There were there in the land there, there were boundary markers for each parcel, but no fences or family name signs as you see in many of the uh, farms or ranches that you might see around. It was just nothing there. You, you just didn't know who owned the land. It could be someone good. It could be someone bad. But for a woman doing this, it just would have been dangerous. Furthermore, as a woman and an outsider, she was especially vulnerable. And she had to be careful where she went. And it's at this point that Boaz enters the story. Now, Boaz, his name means, that name there, it means in him is strength. We're told in verse 1 that he was a relative of Elimelech, that was Naomi's late husband, and is described as a prominent man of noble character. You men that are here, young men that are here, isn't that what you would like to be described as? Wouldn't you like for people to describe you as a prominent man of noble character? And you may think that it's never going to happen. You've messed up too much. You've made too many mistakes. But I can tell you from my personal experience that it's never too late to start over and to gain people's trust, to see that you have changed, to, to have them see that you've changed and that you can become trustworthy. And eventually, over time, God can do a work and you will, he will use you and you will become a man of noble character. So it's possible. So by the providence of God, Ruth gleaned in the portion of the field that belonged to Boaz. Now, although verse 3 says Ruth happened to come to this portion of the field, we have to really understand and know that this wasn't an accident or mere coincidence. Her steps were guided by the Lord. As it says in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9, a person's heart plans his, her ways, her way, but the Lord, the Lord determines his steps. God's providential working in our lives is both a delight and it's also a mystery. God is certainly working with us, in us, and for us, and is accomplishing His gracious purposes. We pray, we seek, seek His will, and we make decisions, and sometimes make mistakes, but it's God who orders events and guides His willing children. In a spectacular vision, the prophet Ezekiel saw, saw the providential workings of God depicted by a throne set on a firmament that was moved here and there by wheels within wheels. And the description, that full description is found in Ezekiel chapter 1. See, my friends, you can't explain it. You can't explain it. But thank God 
you can believe it and rely on it. Now in the next section we'll be reading, we're going to see the next condition that must be met for God to do, for God to work in our lives and circumstances to accomplish His purpose. And again, just to let you know what that first one was, it was, we must live by faith in the Lord. So now let's read, keep reading and look at the second one. We'll be picking up in verse 4. Ruth chapter 2, verse 4. Later, when Boaz arrived from Bethlehem, he said to the harvesters, The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they replied. Boaz asked his servant, who was in charge of the harvesters, Who's that young woman? Whose young woman is this? The servant answered, She is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the territory of Moab. She asked, Will you let me gather fallen grain among the bundles behind the harvesters? She came and has been on her feet since early morning, except that she rested a little in the shelter. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen, my daughter, don't go and gather grain in another field, and don't leave this one, but stay here close to my female servants. Not close to me, but my female servants. See which field they are harvesting and follow them. Haven't I ordered the young men not to touch you? When you are thirsty, go and drink from the jars the young men have filled. She fell face down, bowed to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor with you, so that you notice me, although I am a foreigner? Boaz answered her, answered her Everything you have done for your mother-in-law since your husband's death has been fully reported to me. How you left your father and your mother and your native land, and how you came to a people you didn't previously know. May the Lord reward you for what you've done, and may you received, receive a full reward from the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. My Lord, she said, I have found favor with you, for you have comforted and encouraged your servant, although I am not like one of your female servants. At mealtime, Boaz told, Boaz told her, Come over here and have some bread and dip it in a vinegar sauce. So she sat beside the harvesters, and she offered her roasted, and he offered her roasted grain. She ate and was satisfied, and had some left over. When he got up to gather grain, when she got up to gather grain, Boaz ordered his young men, let her even gather grain among the bundles, and don't humiliate her. Pull out some stalks, from the bundles for her and leave them for her to gather. Don't rebuke her. Once again, I'll stop there. If we want God to work in our lives and circumstances to accomplish his purpose, the second condition is this. We must live by the grace of God. When Ruth set out that morning to glean the fields, she was looking for someone that would show her grace, that would be nice to her, that, would, that wouldn't harass her, that wouldn't give her a hard time because she was a foreigner and a widow, that just would leave her alone, that'd be nice, you know, nothing dramatic. Well, grace, if you didn't know, grace is favor bestowed or given to someone who doesn't deserve it and can't earn it. And God gives us grace too, not because we've earned it, and because he gives grace. As a woman poor widow, and an alien. Ruth could have no claims on anyone. In the eyes of society, she was on the lowest rung of the social ladder. 
but the channel of that grace, the channel of God's grace was Boaz. How good it is to know that God has good people, good, great people in bad times. If you knew only the record in the book of Judges, you might conclude that the righteous had perished from the earth. Again, think back. This was a time when everyone was doing what was right in his own eyes. There was basically lawlessness. You would think, again, that the righteous had just all died off at this time. But there were still people like Boaz who knew the Lord and were looking for ways to obey his will. According to verse 4, Boaz was concerned about his workers and wanted them to enjoy the blessing of the Lord. No sooner had Boaz greeted his workers that than his eye caught the presence of a stranger in the field and a lovely stranger at that. Now, I get the impression that when he saw her, it was love at first sight. For from that point on, Boaz focuses his interest on Ruth and not on the harvest. That's how you know a person really loves you. It's just nothing else matters but your happiness. They want to get to know you. They want to talk to you. They want to spend time with you. Ladies, young ladies, the right man eventually will come along and he's going to love you to pieces and he's going to, his attention is going to be on you. And nothing else. He's not going to care about his video games. He's not going to care about his uh, apps on his phone. He's not going to care about sports. He's just going to be like, man, just hang out. Just spend time together. Though an alien, Ruth was an eligible young woman whom the young men of the town would notice. Now verse 11 indicates that Boaz had already heard about Ruth, but now he was about to meet her personally. Again, we marvel at the overruling providence of God. The Lord led Ruth to the field of Boaz and then Boaz and led Boaz to visit his field right when Ruth was there. It's like they were both there at the right place at the right time. And again, it wasn't coincidence, it wasn't an accident. God put all that together. When Boaz arrived, Ruth might have been resting in the shelter in the shelter house that Boaz provided for his workers, or she might have gone, grown just really tired and gone back home with Naomi. And here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, when we commit our lives, when you commit your life to the Lord, what happens to you happens by the way of appointment and not by accident. When you commit yourself fully to the Lord, everything that happens, happens because the Lord has a plan, has a purpose. And it's not by accident or mere coincidence. Ruth was still a poor widow and an alien. But God was about to create a new relationship that would completely alter her circumstances. I've been a lot of, there have been a lot of people who have mentioned that they can see Boaz, they can see in Boaz a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ in his relationship with his bride, the church. Like Ruth, 
The lost sinner is outside the covenant family of God, bankrupt, with no claim on God's mercy. But God took the initiative and provided a way for us to enter into his family through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, let's notice the evidences of God's grace in the way Boaz related to Ruth. First of all, notice that Boaz took the initiative. <coughs> grace means that God makes the first move to come to our aid. Not because we deserve anything, but because he loves us and wants us for himself. It says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, we love because he first loved us. God took the initiative in salvation when we were spiritually dead, without strength, sinners, and his enemies. Salvation was not an afterthought of God, but that which he planned from eternity. See, we have every reason to believe Boaz loved Ruth and therefore took the first steps to meet her needs. Second, Boaz spoke to Ruth. It was he who spoke to her. She wouldn't, for she wouldn't have dared to speak to a man, especially one who was a stranger and the Lord of the harvest the main guy in charge of the harvest. It was his field. He was the boss in her mind. What right did a widow and an alien have to address a great man, a great and important and rich man like Boaz? Yet he interrupted his conversation with his foreman to speak to a poor stranger gleaning his field. Again, she was picking up the scrubs. There was, she was picking up everything that fell behind the main harvesters. And that was proof that she was poor, she was widowed, there was, or, or a foreigner. Now in a similar way, and here's what I want you to think about. In a similar way, Almighty God has spoken to me, has spoken to you in Jesus Christ, through his word. Through his word. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, God has in these last days spoken to us by his son. In spite of all that a world of sinners has done to the Lord, he, spe he still speaks to us by his grace. Or he, he still speaks to us in, in his grace. He not only speaks the word of salvation, but he also gives us the guidance we need for everyday life. Just as Boaz instructed Ruth, so the Lord also shares his words of wisdom to direct our daily lives. You're going through a major problem. You're going through a major issue. You're going through something really, really hard and difficult. Instead of turning to all these places and all these things for answers, instead of going to, you know, um, psychics and palm readers and, uh, you know, astrology and all that, open up his word. Open up his word. Read the words of Jesus. I'll tell you. I'll tell you again from experience. His words. The words of Jesus. The living word. You will find comfort. You will find peace. You will find 
the answers you need, but you got to pay attention. You can't just read it and be like, oh, you've got to really pay attention to what it's saying and understand what it's saying. And, and really, really, the only way you, you can read the Bible, read God's word, is if you have the spirit of God living in you. He's the one who reveals these truths to you. But you need to surrender your heart. You need to surrender your heart to him. Allow him to come and make his home in you. And it's like the flashers turn on. It's like the lights turn on and you can start seeing everything clearly. You get a fresh vision of God's word. You get a fresh vision of Jesus, of your life, your circumstances. It all starts to fall into place. And the word starts speaking to you personally. And that's when everything begins to change. Again, the Lord shares his wisdom through his word. And directly in your daily life. You see, the Lord, Jesus, is the Lord of the harvest. The Lord of the harvest. And assigns to us a place in his field. All right. A third evidence of God's grace in the way Boaz related to Ruth is this. Boaz promised to protect Ruth and to provide for her needs. Boaz called Ruth my daughter because she was younger than he was. But it's also a term of endearment. Back then, it was my daughter. Nowadays, it's honey, sweetie. You know, it's a, it's a term of endearment. He would treat her like a member of his family. Boaz instructed his young men to protect her and the young women to work with her. She was to walk with the female servants who followed immediately after the reapers so in other words, Ruth had, Ruth had first chance at the best of the gleanings. Rather than being the last one in the line of those that were picking up, she was the first one right behind the gleaners or right behind the reapers. Boaz even instructed his workers to allow her to glean among the sheaves and told them to deliberately drop some of the harvest so that she can pick it up. If she was hungry or thirsty, she would refresh herself with the workers. In fact, Boaz ate with her and personally handed her the food. What a picture of the grace of God. The master became like the servants that he might show his love to a foreigner. Ruth had no idea that Boaz had commanded his workers to be generous to her, but she believed his word and found that her needs were met. Jesus Christ, my friends, came to the earth as a servant that he might save us and make us part of his family. He has shared with us the riches of his mercy and love, the riches of his grace, the riches of his wisdom and knowledge. His riches in glory. And yes, his unsearchable riches. We, undeserving foreigners, are members of the family of God and have all his inheritance at his disposal, at, I'm sorry, at our disposal. Fourth, Boaz encouraged Ruth. Ruth's response to Boaz was one of humility and gratitude. She acknowledged her own unworthiness and accepted his grace. She didn't say, no, 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 I don't deserve it. Give it to somebody else. 
No, she said, she's thankful. She was humble. Thank you so much. Thank you. And accepted it. Accept his grace. She believed his promises and rejoiced in them. There was no need for Ruth to worry, for the wealthy Lord of the harvest would care for her and Naomi. Now, how did she know he would care for her? Well, he gave her this promise. He gave her his promise. And she knew, she knew without a doubt that he could be trusted. Again, he was a man of noble character. Ruth neither looked back at her tragic past, nor did she look at herself and consider her sorry plight. She fell at his feet. She fell at the feet of the master and submitted herself to him. She looked away from her poverty and focused on his riches. She forgot her fears and rested on his promises. So what an example that is for us. God's people today to follow. Find that there's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of people who are miserable because they don't obey the admonition of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, where it says they're fixing our eyes on Jesus. It means keeping your eyes completely on Jesus. That's why they're miserable. They spend too much time looking at themselves. They spend so much time looking at their circumstances and other people that they fail to do what Ruth did. Namely, center her attention, center their attention on their master. Instead of resting on, in his perfections, they focus on their own imperfections. Instead of seeing his spiritual riches, they complain about bankruptcy. They go to church to get their needs met instead of going to church to worship the God who is greater than any need. Did you know that? Did you know that while you're sitting here or standing and we're worshiping, singing songs of praise and worship, you are worshiping the creator of the universe. You are worshiping the God who holds your life in the palm of his hands. What kind of attitude ought to, ought, should you have? What kind of heart should you have? Are you, like, are you standing there, sitting there, saying, oh, I don't like this song? I don't like the music. But you're not really paying attention to the words. It doesn't matter what you, how you, about you. This worship is about God. It's all about Him. Someone is up here singing their heart out and singing to the, to the Lord. I feel I, I, I find it more, and I'm sure the Lord finds it more beautiful because it's coming from a heart rather than having someone up here who's just trying to perform, who's just trying to put on a show. He doesn't care what your voice sounds like. He doesn't care, like, he doesn't care about that. He wants to know what's in your heart. He cares, what's it, he cares about what's in your heart. If you're a believer, if you're a Christian, and you know you're saved, and you know you're going to be going to heaven. Do you know the book of Revelation describes that we're going to be worshiping him, singing songs to God, to Jesus? I'm telling you now, might as well get used to it. Might as well get used to those singing songs of praise. But again, what I'm saying is pay attention to the words. Our God is an awesome God. Yes, He is. Yeah, He is. 
so many great, beautiful, even the hymns. I, I don't want ever want to forget about the hymns. The hymns have great theology in them, and they have great words. And I usually, you know, we usually try to have at least one hymn during our worship set. And whenever we get a musicians up here, I want to hopefully they'll incorporate that too into their worship. But hymns are beautiful. Read those hymns. Sing to the Lord. All right. Again, they go to church. These people go to church to get their needs met instead of going to church to worship the God who is greater than any need. They need to hear the counsel of the little poem a radio listener said one time, a long, long time ago. Look at the self and be distressed. Look at others and be depressed. Look at others and you'll be blessed. Okay, fifth, Boaz saw it to it saw to it that she was satisfied. All of this happened to Ruth because of her faith, of her faith in the God of Israel. Boaz fully knew Ruth's story. So it didn't take long for the news to travel in a little town, in a little town like Bethlehem. He knew that Ruth had abandoned her home and her gods and had put her faith in Jehovah. She had taken refuge under his wings. Now that image there, under his wings, sometimes refers to the hen protecting her little chickies, her chicks. But it can also refer to the wings of a cherub, of the cherubim. A cherubim are angels. It can also refer to the wings of the cherubim in the Holy of Holies. It's going to take too long for me to describe, to describe the Holy of Holies, but you know what it is. It's the wings of those angels there. Ruth was no longer a foreigner and a stranger. She was not only accepted by the God of Israel, but she was also dwelling in the very Holy of Holies with him. There's a, verse, there's a word there in verse 11 says the word is answered. Well, that word literally uh, translated, it literally means raised his voice. And here's the point. Boaz was getting excited. He wanted everybody to hear what he thought about Ruth. He wasn't ashamed to be identified with her. She had trusted God. And she had proved her faith by cleaving, by holding on to her mother-in-law and becoming part of the people of Israel in Bethlehem. Now, the phrase comforted and encouraged, the words that she said in verse 13, it means spoke to the heart, spoken to the heart. The word of God comes from the heart of God. Let me repeat that. The word of God, everything here, comes from the heart of God to the hearts of his people and gives encouragement and hope. You listen to the voices of the world, your heart will be encouraged, your, you, you will be discouraged. You will find discouragement. But if you listen to the voice of God from His Word, in His Word, your heart will be encouraged. The Word of God and the Son of God can fully satisfy the heart of the believer. When you seek for satisfaction anywhere else, you will find yourself disobedient and dissatisfied. The lost world labors for that which doesn't satisfy, but the believer has full satisfaction because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a hymn writer put it, Well of water ever springing, bread of life so rich and free, untold wealth that never faileth, my Redeemer is to me. Hallelujah, I have found him, 
whom my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longings. Through his blood, I am now saved. We must live by faith, and we must depend on God's grace. But there's now a third condition that we must meet, and it's found here in this last section that we're about to read. So verse 17, Ruth chapter 2, verse 17. So Ruth gathered grain in the field until evening. She beat out, she beat out what she had gathered, and it was about 26 quarts of barley. She picked up the grain and went into town, where her mother-in-law saw that she had, uh, what she had gleaned. She brought out what she, had, what she had left over from her meal and gave it to her. Her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you gather barley today, and where did you work? May the Lord bless the man who, who noticed you. Ruth told her mother-in-law, whom she had worked with, and said, The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May the Lord bless him, because he has, he has not abandoned his kindness to the living or the dead. Naomi continued, The man is a close relative. He is one of our family redeemers. Ruth the Moabitess said, He also told me, Stay with my young men until they have finished all of my harvest. So Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Ruth, my daughter, it is good for you to work with his female servants so that nothing will happen to you in another field. Ruth stayed close to Boaz's female servants and gathered grain until the, until the barley and the wheat harvest were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. The third condition we must meet is we must live in hope. All day long, Ruth labored with a happy and hopeful heart. She didn't have to worry about the men harassing her or the other, or the other workers hindering her. She had food when she was hungry, drink when she was thirsty, and a place to rest when she became tired. The grain was gleaned. The, the grain she gleaned amounted to about half a bushel, enough food for the two women for nearly a week. Also, verse 18 indicates that she had some leftovers from her lunch. So not only was Ruth a diligent worker, but she was also careful not to waste anything God had given her. How will Naomi respond to Ruth's, Ruth's experiences? Well, the last time, remember the last time we met Ruth, we saw Ruth? She was sharing her bitterness with the women of Bethlehem and blaming God for her sorrow and her poverty. When Ruth had asked permission to go to the fields and glean, <clears throat> all Naomi said to her was, go, go, my daughter. She gave her daughter-in-law no word of encouragement, not even the promise of her prayers. But now, in verse 19, we hear a new word from Naomi's lips. Bless. She not only blessed Ruth's benefactor, but she also blessed the Lord. We've moved now from bitterness to blessedness. When Naomi saw the grain, she blessed the man who allowed Ruth to work in his field. And when she heard that the man was Boaz, Naomi Bless the Lord. What a change. What a change has taken place in the heart of a grieving widow. Again, she lost her husband and her two sons. This change came about because of the new hope that she had in her heart. And the one who gave her that new hope was Boaz. <coughs> Naomi had hope. Because of who Boaz was, a near kinsman, <coughs> which means a relative. 
who was wealthy and influential. Now, as we'll see, a near kinsman could rescue relatives from poverty and give them a new beginning. But she also have, had hope because of what Boaz did. He showed kindness to Ruth and took a personal interest in her situation. When Ruth shared with Naomi what Boaz had, what Boaz had said, Naomi's hope grew even stronger because the words of Boaz revealed his love for Ruth and his desire to make her happy. The fact that Boaz insisted on Ruth staying close to his servants and his field was proof to Naomi that her husband's relative was making plans and included her that included her and her daughter-in-law. Shouldn't we, who believe in Jesus Christ, rejoice in hope? When you consider who Jesus is, what he's done for you, what he says to you in his word, there's no reason for you to feel hopeless. Jesus Christ, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is the Son of God. He died for us, and right now he's interceding for you, for us in heaven. In his word, he has given us very great and precious promises that, listen carefully, that can never fail, that will never fail. So no matter how you feel today, no matter how difficult your circumstances may be, you can rejoice in hope if you will focus your faith in Jesus Christ. The American agnostic lecturer, Robert G. Ingersoll, called hope the only universal liar who never loses his reputation or veracity. But the late Norman Cousins, former editor of the Saturday Review, who miraculously survived an almost incurable illness and a severe heart attack, unequivocally disagrees with Ingersoll. Quote, the human body experiences a powerful gravitational pull in the direction of hope, Cousins wrote. That's why the patient's hopes are the physician's secret weapon. They are the hidden ingredients in any prescription, unquote. In his work with patients at the UCLA School of Medicine, Cousins proved the power of hope to change people's lives. So for the Christian believer, hope is not a shallow, hope-so feeling generated by optimistic fantasies. Hope is an inner sense of joyful assurance and confidence as we trust God's promises and face the future with his help. This hope is God's gift to his children through the Holy Spirit, who reminds us God's, of God's promises found in his word. Ruth's half bushel of grain was the first fruits of all that Boaz would do in the future, just as the Holy Spirit within us is the first fruits of what God has promised us. Although root supply grain would be gone in a week, the witness of the Spirit within us will remain until, all, until our hopes are all fulfilled when we finally see Jesus Christ. The exciting new hope that now possessed the, new, the two widows was centered in a person, Boaz, just as our hope, just as your hope, I hope, is centered in the Son of God. In fact, Jesus Christ is our hope. Through faith in Christ, we've been born again into a living hope. And because it's a living hope, it grows stronger and stronger and stronger each day 
Not only that, but it produces fruit. The hopes that the world clings to are dead. They're dead hopes. But ours, as believers, as Christians, it's a living hope. You know why? Because it's rooted in the living Christ. Well, Naomi then explained here. I'm closing up here soon. Naomi then explained to Ruth the law of the kinsman redeemer. It, just, it wasn't just kindness and love and love of Boaz for Ruth that gave Naomi confidence. For those wonderful, those wonderful feelings, we all know this, could change overnight. It was the principle of redemption. It was the principle that redemption, the principle of redemption that God had written in his word that gave Naomi the assurance that Boaz, that Boaz would rescue them. A near relative, as a near relative, Boaz could redeem his family property that Elimelech had mortgaged when, his, when he took his family to Moab. Naomi wasn't wealthy enough to redeem it. But Boaz, he could buy it back and keep it in the family. However, something else was involved. The wife of the deceased went with the property. Did you hear that? The wife of the deceased went with the property. Therefore, the kinsman redeemer had to marry her and bring up her children bearing the name of the deceased. They would then inherit the property and the family name and family possessions would continue to be theirs. This is known as the uh, Leverite marriage. The word lever is Latin for a husband's brother. The author of the book of Ruth doesn't explain how Ruth's husband, Malon, and we'll read about him soon um, in chapter 4, how he was connected with his father's property so that Ruth had to be included in the purchase. When and why the Jewish people connected the law of the kinsman redeemer with the law of the Liverite marriage isn't made, it's not made clear to us. But that was the custom in Ruth's time. Naomi cautioned Ruth to obey the commands of Boaz and stay close to his servants as she gleaned a field. The barley har- harvest occurred during March and April and the wheat harvest during June and July. Meanwhile, Ruth kept busy and gathered food sufficient for herself and her mother-in-law. But now she was laboring, motivated by a wonderful hope. She was joyfully anticipating the day of redemption. Friends, it really is encouraging to see the changes that have taken place in Naomi, because of what Ruth did. God used Ruth to turn Naomi's bitterness into gratitude, her own belief into faith, and her despair into hope. One person, trusting the Lord and obeying His will, can change a situation from defeat to victory. Ruth's faith in God's word led her to the field of Boaz. The love of Boaz for Ruth compelled him to pour out his grace upon her and meet her every need. So you see, church, grace is love that pays the price to help the undeserving one. Let me repeat that. Grace is love that pays the price to help the undeserving one. Ruth's experience of grace gave her new hope as she anticipated what her kinsman redeemer would do. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, and now abide faith, hope, love. And they still abide with us as we abide in Jesus Christ. And trust in him. So as I now close this message. 
Maybe you're going through a really difficult time. Maybe your home situation, it just sucks. It's horrible. You don't have anyone to look up to. Everyone has disappointed you. You feel lonely in this world. You try to look at different people, different places to find encouragement, to find hope, but you haven't been able to find it. Your heart is bitter. Maybe you're angry towards God because he put you in that situation. Let me tell you this. Maybe he put you in, in that situation to get you to this point where you can just trust him. Where you can just come to him on your knees and say, Lord, I need you. When you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, when you make him the Lord of your life, your bitterness will turn into gratitude. Your unbelief will turn into faith. And your despair will turn into hope. You, as a sinner, as an unbeliever, you're an outsider. You're an outsider. You're not part of the family of God. But if you'd like to be part of that family, all you got to do is come to the cross and confess your sins. So if that's what you'd like to do today, if you're ready to make Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior, make, to make him the Lord of your life, I'm going to lead you in a prayer to do that. So wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And with all your heart, with all sincerity, because God again knows, he knows what's inside your heart. Pray this. Lord Jesus, I admit and confess that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose from the dead. So now I repent of all my sins. I turn away from them and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, please reach out to us. We want to help you in your next steps of the Christian walk, whether it's finding a, a good Bible teaching church in your area. But if you're here in El Paso, we want to invite you to come check us out here in Northeast El Paso. Let us know how we can bless you. I want to thank you for taking time again to watch this video. Uh, share it, like it, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, it's not about that, but, you know, you know how, how it is. Send it out uh, if, you, if you want to. Bless others. But thank you again. Look forward to uh, seeing you all again next week and as we now get into Chapter 3. This is a great love story. It's not done yet. So uh, uh, get excited. Best is yet to come. Be blessed. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. 
Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.